Good afternoon, May. Hi. Hi. Watergate Hotel. The Watergate Hotel. All Back the to the Watergate. We don't even have reservations there, and we're there every week. We don't know the right people. The hotel manager isn't in your address book. He was in the address book of the men that were arrested there. Let's uh, let's review what the Watergate Hotel means. Okay. Um, what is the Watergate Hotel besides a hotel? Let's see, the anniversary of the Watergate Affair. I'm calling it the Watergate Affair. Um, I hope it becomes known as that and not uh, passed off as something very insignificant. It's, felt, it's going out of the news now um, three weeks ago, June 17th. Is that two weeks ago? Three. This track of time seems so long. I've been working on it for so long. The early hour of morning of June the 17th, a guard was walking around... Um, the Watergate Hotel down at the basement and making rounds, a uh, security guard there. It's a hotel in Washington, D.C. It's a very lush hotel with a complex of uh, offices that rent there, too. And um, it's the home of John and Martha Mitchell. Our friends John and Martha reside at the Watergate Hotel. And the it's also the home of the uh, Democratic National Committee. They have offices at the Watergate Hotel. And other uh, political parties also have offices there. And early hour morning, the uh, guard was walking around and saw scotch tape, and he removed it from the door and went back to the desk and had a hunch, what he called a hunch. And he went back to where the scotch tape was removed, and it, somebody had put another piece of scotch tape over the door that kept it supposedly from catching. And this is an interesting story in itself, because the guard later said, the doors opened and closed. The Watergate affair is going to be the biggest story in the nation, I hope, if there's not a news blackout on it. And it seems that somebody inside of that group of five men has to be possibly counterintelligence because they wanted to be caught. They put scotch tape over the latches of the doors from the eighth floor down and from the basement up, and they were working on the sixth floor the gentlemen that were caught, arrested. And the guard said that the doors opened and closed. There wasn't any need for the tape. And anybody who's done surveillance or bugging means it wouldn't match or some instrument in the door, and you don't need tape. It's visible. So somebody in there or some god in heaven is watching over and sending down this guard, you know, who sees the tape. It was some kind of a message uh, the hotel and security people filled. But anyway, the guard called the Washington Special Squad, please. The men arrived and went traced the tape over various doors up to the sixth floor of the Democratic National Committee, and five men were working in that office, removing the ceiling panels um, over the desks where Larry O'Brien, Brian, chairman of the Democratic National Committee, works and other members of the committee. The, the men had fancy dinner suits. They had been eating dinner downstairs, uh, five, these five men. They dined on lobster. They had their mace fountain pens in their pockets and surgical rubber gloves on their hands, and they had thousands of dollars worth of expensive camera equipment and radios and walkie-talkies and electronic devices. Um, supposedly $30,000 had already been spent on these particular men for hotel reservations, rooms, and equipment. Now, those men were not just common, ordinary criminals. They had backgrounds which uh, were, well, they still are very interesting uh, to many people, including you as a researcher. <laughs> but. Uh, they, yeah. they they had some interesting ties. Well, they had interesting ties, and of uh, the five men that were arrested, we'll go into the ties of the men, the five men that were arrested belonged to a nine-man team. In May, May 26th to 29th, nine men registered at the Watergate Hotel, all using aliases. And the aliases they used were out of a novel uh, written by CIA writer Howard Hunt. He's written 40 or 42 novels, fictions, detective stories, and um, the names that they registered came from his novels. And there were nine men there at the hotel, May 26th, 29th, and again on the 17th, 18th. Four got away, and it's two weeks later now, and four are still not arrested or have not been found, and nobody is saying where they were. The uh, apartment that the Mitchells live in, in the Watergate Hotel, could be connected to the electronic devices that were being set up in the... Democratic headquarters. John Mitchell was the head of the Justice Department, the Attorney General of the United States, until a few months ago when he resigned to head the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon, which he considers 
more important than being the Attorney General of the United States at this time. John Mitchell had the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon. He lives at the Watergate Hotel. One of the men arrested was under the salary of the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon at the time he was arrested. He got $1,200 the month of April, the month of May, and I assume the month of June. He was employed by the committee to elect Richard Nixon, and he was arrested uh, putting bugging devices or taking them from the Democratic headquarters. There were six, five men that were arrested, and the news media swept right in with what I call the cover story, because all the five men were directly related to the Central Intelligence Agency, um, and they were all related to the Bay of Pigs invasion, too. That was just 11 years ago, and that was the time that John Kennedy said, I'm going to tear the CIA to shreds and cast it to the wind. He referred to a hidden government behind his back. Away from the Watergate one minute, uh, in August we did a show called, uh, it was about Jack Anderson's article called Balderdash. Remember a researcher on political assassinations named Dan Wrighty, who lives in San Francisco, sent information to Jack Anderson in Washington that a high-level plot had killed John Kennedy, and he mentioned members of the White House, the CIA, the FBI, the military, and the syndicate were all involved in killing President John Kennedy. And this was following the Bay of Pigs invasion, too, just a year and a half after he canceled the Bay of Pigs invasion. Well, Jack Anderson uh, wrote an article that went all over the country, country titled Balderdash, in which he put down the researchers and this particular research job as being impossible or silly, and he just throws it to the wind that there is any conspiracy in the United States to kill the president or candidate at the election season. Well, Jack Anderson's name came up when one of the men arrested at the um, Watergate Hotel, Mr. Frank Sturgis, surfaced. And who was at court speaking up for Frank Sturgis? His little old friend, Jack Anderson. He supplies information to Jack Anderson on uh, the Miami Cuban, exiled Cuban community and CIA and the FBI. Jack Anderson, uh, Sturgis is part of the FBI, contacts with the FBI. He's a CIA agent. He is was born in Cuba. He's a, a, worked with the anti-Castro Cubans. He's an important person. Was important links in the Miami uh, area and with the assassination teams and the entire operation as it breaks down. So uh, once and for all, if you think Jack Anderson tells the total truth, he may tell some truth, like the ITT or Kissinger, uh, the memo for, that he took from the National Security Council about Kissinger and his opinions about India, double dealing State Department with India and Pakistan. But Jack Anderson has um, money, mind, just like anybody else. His truths are selective. If he gets information from a particular man, and he likes that informer. And if that man is directly or indirectly, even indirectly, involved with anything like a political conspiracy, Jack Anderson has not touched the conspiracy. And it isn't hard to figure out now why he, is, he has selective truth. But when he put down these organizations, um, I'm going to tell you the organizations that are involved at the Watergate Hotel, and the same organizations were involved in the killing of John Kennedy. The names are different now, and I may, I have so much material, I'm going to try and go slow and not jump around, but we're going to be referring, as I go through the cast of characters of the Watergate, we're going to be referring to the White House, the CIA, the FBI, the military, every branch, the Army, Navy, the Air Patrol, and the troops, and the organized crime. They were all involved with members that were arrested at the Watergate, just like they were in the John Kennedy murder, but maybe people will understand who listen to these shows and take them for a long time, maybe they will understand how the agencies combine forces to work together if I can break through the chain of command at the Watergate Hotel. Uh, there were the five men arrested and the news media, we'll get back to the cover story, the news media, what little news we had, came over that it was either a bugging party or a robbery or it was exile Cubans wanting to find out what the Democrats were going to do with Castro. Uh, do you remember your impression when the first wire services came over, Phil, what 
if we weren't working together on our show here, do you remember what kind of conversation uh, you've heard about the Watergate? Well, my first impression was that the Republicans were out to find out the secrets of the Democratic Party. That was my first impression. A surveillance party. Right. Yeah. To, you know, to go through the files and and then plant bugging devices so they could overhear what uh, strategies were planned for the, uh, the presidential campaign. First impressions. Yeah. Yeah. That well, that was like they have the surveillance equipment so they could pick up conversations. That's right. And the impression was John Mitchell said uh, McCord, James McCord, who was hired by them for the security for the Republican uh, committee, must have been there with other clients. He, they disassociated themselves from the four other men and said, well, McCord is our security agent. We fire him now. But he was serving other clients. And yeah, therefore... That's, right. That's That later proved to be not true, though. <laughs> well... That he didn't have, really even have a security agency of his own. That's right. He didn't he had no security agent. He, and his money is coming from the Central Intelligence Agency. That's his client. You know, that's who he's working for. Well, five men were arrested. One was James McCord, Jr. Um, he was registered under an alias. And the other man, Frank Sturgis, Anderson's friend, Eugenio Martinez, Virgilio Gonzalez, and Bernard Barker. Um, James McCord, Jr., the man who was working for other clients, left the Central Intelligence Agency in 1970. He did work there for 19 years. Three years prior to that, he was in the FBI in radio work. He left there in 1970. His newest job recently was to, he was appointed the Chief of Security for the Committee to Re-elect Richard Nixon. But James McCord had two jobs at the same time. He was chief of security for Nixon's re-election, and then he was chosen by the Secret Service to be the chief of security for the Republican National Convention in Miami. Now, Mr. McCord is to be in charge of all safety inside the building and outside and of the President of the United States. He's the chief of security for the Republican National Convention appointed by the White House and President Nixon, and he's caught in the Watergate Hotel with men who have $89,000 worth of cash to pay provocateurs to make street fights in Miami. Now, this is going to get really heavy. He is caught with the men who are handing out hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, to make fights. And then Mr. McCord is going to secure Miami. He's now, now the, they were caught with money. They, they had caught. large sums of money when they were arrested, is that right? They were caught with but a where, lot. How do you tie in that this is money to be paid to uh, well, we'll do the provocateurs? Whole, we'll do the whole money trip um, in a second. We'll go into the men, who they were first, and then we'll do okay, their money. Okay, I want to establish that because you, that's, oh, kind, that's, a hard to state, that's a hard statement to, oh, to you make. Want, okay, <laughs> you want to go right to the money? The source of the money? Well, oh. can you just touch briefly on what oh. makes you feel that oh, yes. the money is for provocateurs, and then we can come back to the Oh, yeah, let's go. Men. Let's as long as we're tying them all together. When they were arrested, the men had $6,500 on them in cash in their pockets, in the hotel room and in their pockets, and all the money collected at the time of arrest was $100 bills in consecutive order, crisp new $100 bills. Bernard Barker was the fund man who accounted for the 6500 and he said it came from a larger fund at the Republic National Bank in Miami. The Republic National Bank said that Bernard Barker deposited $89,000 there in April, $89,000. So the investigators or the news media wanted to know the source of that 89, and it was traced to a bank in Mexico City that has not yet been identified where it came from. Now, the bank in Mexico City claimed that it was a real estate deal that fell through, and Mr. Barker received 89000 for a deal. It would be interesting if Barker pays an income tax on that 89000 He's going to get a wallop if that's his cash. The Mexican money, see, the CIA has several ways of funding things. They don't just write a check and say, here, boys, go hound out the money. But Mr. Barker was seen with, with other witnesses. He had a seven-man secret team that went down to Miami to recruit provocateurs to go to Washington in May. But when J. Edgar Hoover died, they were transferred to, uh, uh, they were supposed to go to New York. They were transferred to Washington. 
Now, where it, does that information come from? All I've got this from, uh, I take eight papers a day. But I mean, the statement that they were down there to recruit. But this was for the Washington tourists. Post. For the Washington Post described a seven man secret team headed by Bernard Barker and four of the men that were arrested at the Watergate, that they went to Miami and they were recruiting men and they had spent $10,000. Recruiting men for what purpose? To, to make demonstrations in New York City in May. Now, the this, Washington Post said that. Yes, that the men were hired from Miami. This is taxpayers' money to go to, to New York City. And everyone in Miami knew this was CIA money floating because they were $100 of consecutive order. Barker belonged to a seven-man secret committee. Seven were arrested at the um, Watergate Hotel. Three were in Miami at the time of the arrest. One left the country because he says something bad is going to happen, and he's splitting. So he left the country. One of the men has left. Two of the men in the scene so far have left the country. Um, what the U.S. taxpayers' money goes into is to get men, such as the men hired in Miami, to go to New York City and all over the United States to demonstrate uh, if Nixon escalates the war, the bombing, then these men get out on the street and fight the people who are demonstrating and pretend they want the war. This is what he was hiring people to demonstrate to support the bombing of Hyde Park. J. Edgar Hoover died, so they moved the men. These particular men, I mean, there's hundreds of them all over the country. I'm talking about one little pocket at the Watergate that was caught. They moved them from New York to Washington and where J. Edgar Hoover's body was lying in state. These paid provocateurs from Miami were demonstrating and people were actually shot. This was the $100 bills that were coming from that body of money from the Mexico Bank to the Republic National Bank to Bernard Barker, who was caught with 6,500 of it. He said 30000 of that money already went to Watergate expenses and electronic equipment. You see, the court isn't going to say, James McCord, the CIA bought me this equipment at the Watergate, but it came from Mexico. The other source of funds, that this, you want to know where the hunk of the money comes from an operation like that uh, before well, we go into Not only it. where it comes from, but the fact that it's designated to hire provocateurs in Miami during the conventions, that's... Um Oh, yeah. Well, each Dra one of these... A drastic statement to make. Oh, I'm going to show you where each one had a particular assignment from the White House down, and then I'll go into the reasons for it and the motive for it. I hope I'm not going too fast, and then people get lost. When they pick up the show, we're talking about the Watergate Hotel and the people in the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. that were arrested, five men on June the 17th. Back to the financing of the operation, two men arrested in the Watergate Hotel. Mr. Martinez and Bernard Barker had in their possession the name of Howard Hunt with W.H. after it, meaning White House. And the news media comes out with the story that Mr. Hunt has either left the country or gone incommunicado, that he's a former CIA agent, that he's a writer. Who is Howard Hunt? Howard Hunt worked 21 years with the Central Intelligence Agency. He planned the Bay of Pigs invasion. When he skipped the country and they went to his desk at the White House, they found a set of two walkie-talkies that could connect to the walkie-talkies that were taken at the time of arrest from the Waterhouse bunch. He had that gun inside the White House. And Howard Hunt worked for the Central Intelligence Agency 21 years. James McCord, who was arrested, worked with them 19 years. So these were co-partners to a large hunk of American history if you think of what's happened in the last 21 years. Well, Howard Hunt had an office. He worked as, in quotes, a White House consultant, 21 years with the White House, with the CIA, and, and at the time of his arrest, he still was getting paychecks through the White House. He was not, um, he, his office supposedly was with Mr. Bennett across the street as a writer for the, uh, uh, now that he's out of the CIA, but he had a desk at the White House at the time he left the country. The desk that he had with Mr. Bennett, Robert Bennett, the son of Senator Bennett of Utah, Senator W. Bennett of Utah, his son had a Washington public relations firm across the street from the White House, and Howard Hunt had a desk there. He worked there. Now, when the story broke, Robert Bennett admitted that he was the source of all the secret money that was collected for President Nixon's re-election up till April 1st, you know, a lot of people are saying, where did John Mitchell get $10 million? 
It's such a coincidence that the man who raised all that ten million, his name, the name of the man that shares the desk with him, was on the two men at the Watergate Hotel. Now, Howard Hunt shares a desk in the office with Robert Bennett. Bennett had 75 to 90 committees set up. The title of his organization is called The American Dream. This is the American Dream Machine. It's too funny. You know, you're, I can't pass it up. The American Dream Machine. Supporters of the American Dream. And they raised $10 million. But Mitchell refuses to say where the money came from. Now, this is from all the states. Some of the money, 325000 of this money, Ralph Nader said, came from 68 different committees of the Associated Milk Company. And that by raising the milk prices for Richard Nixon, by his allowing them on the price freeze to raise the milk, they could make up the loss that they gave to this funding. This is what Ralph Nader was claiming just a little while ago, that uh, Ray, President Nixon raised the government milk support prices, and therefore the 325000 they donate to Richard Nixon's committee to Mr. Bennett and Hunt makes up for the money that the Republicans get. If you drink your milk today, you may be buying a gunman for the Democratic Convention. You're paying a man to be out there in Miami if you have your glass of milk today. That's about where it's going, you know. Everybody likes milk. Everybody likes milk. You see those big signs. Now, let's get the money thing. Especially Richard Nixon's. Okay. Let's get the money thing straight. You have Howard Hunt, whose desk connects to the walkie-talkie at the Watergate Hotel, who has a gun in the uh, desk at the White House. You have him 21 years in the CIA. He shares the office with Bennett. $10 million unaccounted dollars. Now, I call this the money circle. If James McCord was arrested and he's with, being paid by Bernard Barker, who has $89,000 from a Mexican bank unaccounted for, isn't the central intelligence, if they're putting, if the fund for Nixon is putting that money into Mexico, it's a money circle game. You follow? If the unaccounted money were deposited in the Mexico City Bank, and then went to the Republican National Bank in Miami, it pays James McCord, who's also employed by the committee to re-elect Richard Nixon. The same committee that hires him with one salary could deposit money and pay him to bug the water gate through the Mexican bank while they pay him to secure them on the other level. You see the circle game? Do you understand the money game now? Is that clear for everyone who's listening? Is it clear enough, Phil? I think so how the money transacts. The man who's arrested at the Watergate Hotel, James McCord, was under salary to John Mitchell's committee to re-elect Richard Nixon at the time he was arrested. At the time he was arrested, he was paid by Bernard Barker, who's the conduit of funds for the CIA, who's $89,000 in Mexico that goes to Miami isn't accounted for. So if the money that Bennett raises goes to Mexico and back to Miami, the same bank is paying him from two different places, from the Washington office and from the Mexican bank. He's getting money from the two. So you're saying the CIA funds are going directly to the Republican National Committee also? Yes, that's right. Yeah, these $10 million of secret money are used for anything they want. If they are hiring McCord to be char chief of security, now, let's run down some of these names that were arrested, and then I'm going into the motives for all this, too, because before we go too far, we've got the funding. I mentioned Sturgis, Martinez, Gonzalez, Bernard Barker. Uh, two names were supposed to have gotten away that leaked out that were possibly there at the hotel. Two of the four men, one was Angel Ferrer, and the other one was Humberto Lopez. Now, we're going to go into the meaning of the Watergate thing and the motive for breaking in there. And then we have to go back to our early shows that I've done many times, and I refer to them over again because I never wanted the people who listen to Dialogue Conspiracy to lose track of the name of Lewis Tacklett because Lewis Tacklett surfaced in September 1971 as an agent with the Los Angeles Police Department. And I 
keep mentioning this is very little that I've repeated on every on any of the shows in the 52 weeks we've been on, but I do want to repeat the Lewis Tackwood charges, uh, the reason for his news conference last September, because uh, it's important to the Watergate affair. And when people talk about something that happened in the past or something they're not familiar with, they lose it and can't put the whole story together. And I want to put the Tackwood allegations to the Watergate, Lewis Tagwood claimed that he had worked for criminal conspiracy section of Los Angeles, that they plant conspiracies, the LA Police Department has assassination squads, <coughs> they are directly involved in counterplots, conspiracies, and assassinations. And Tag would work for surveillance, intelligence, and investigation. He was assigned the position last year for Squad 19. This is a group that goes through the State Justice Department of Evel Younger into Washington. It is a coordinated contingency plan set up for the Miami, and it was the San Diego conventions that they've been moved to Miami. The plan remains, the same people remain, only the location of the site is changed. Squad 19's purpose was to provoke violence at the Republican National Convention in 1972 that they were to have battles, they were to have agents on the street in demonstrations, that they were to have agents and filter the groups that were going to plan demonstrations against war and poverty, and that these agents would provoke street battles with the police surrounding the convention hall, and the agents inside the convention hall would plant explosives and blow up whoever was in the hall, congressmen, newsmen, public officials, representatives of the Republican Party would be inside the convention hall and they would be blown up. And at the same time they'd be blown up, there'd be riots in the street and the delegates would be killed. And what was the purpose of all this killing? The same purpose of the hijacking. If you get all those hijackings, these are provocateurs, they're all phony, and after they're hired, they're killed. This rash of hijacking every morning that you see in your paper, two or three new ones, is the latest provocation to to get fear in the country. We don't have national strikes and the people aren't on the street objecting to the escalation of the war. The, the hijacking scene are paid <coughs> political provocateurs. I say it now, within six or eight months, one of them is going to break and live and talk and the chain of command from that will be broken down like the street riders. But we're talking about <coughs> right now at the convention that they will get these people out on the streets and create fights at which time Richard Nixon can't invoke special emergency powers called martial law and cancel the elections in 1972. That the chance that somebody like McGovern would make it or a populist candidate would win will not be allowed. There are going to be killings. We're talking now that conventions are during the next week. There are going to be a lot of people killed in Miami. I hope I am wrong, but I can't see any way that it's going to be avoided. There's going to be a lot of planned killing at the Democratic and the National Convention. They have been planned for a long time. Lewis Tackwood had the name of a man to call in the White House as part of this Squad 19, and it was the same Howard Hunt who was involved in the Watergate affair. <laughs> we'll be back with uh, part two of Dialogue Conspiracy. After we identify the station, you're listening to KLRB FM Carmel in your radio 24 hours a day. And we are with, as we are every week at this time, political research specialist May Brussel. They were talking about conventions, the uh, Glasshouse Papers, Lewis Tackwood, the Watergate Hotel. Why don't you pick it up? Okay, we're talking about the break-in at the Watergate Hotel, June 17th, and five men were arrested. The Watergate Hotel is in Washington, D.C., the home of John and Martha Mitchell. <laughs> it sounds like a soap opera, you know, the little sweetheart. He refers to as the little sweetheart, John and Martha Mitchell. And um, it's also the home of the Democratic National Committee, and five people were arrested uh, with bugging devices and surveillance equipment at the Watergate Hotel, and we're going into who these people were. One of the men was James McCord, 19 years with the CIA, and we'll get back to Lewis Packwood on the motive for Squad 19, which corresponds to the break-in at the Watergate Hotel, uh, where Packwood talks about 
um, the plans to cancel the elections and create chaos and riots in the street. Now I'm going into the information that I've accumulated about what I call the Watergate gang and how would they fit into this Squad 19 plan. The most shocking um, revelation was that the man arrested, James McCord, who, was, who had the dual job of Chief of Security for the Republican National Committee and the Chief of Security for the Republican National Convention, is a Lieutenant Colonel Reserves in the United States Army. And James McCord sits on a special 16-man unit in Washington, D.C., the Emergency Contingency Unit to take care of radicals. <laughs> this is his job, is that James McCord sits, and four months ago he left that unit because uh, they said, well, he is off of the unit now. But a, a Army colonel and a captain in the Navy both gave information about McCord on that committee. The Army, the Navy, the Reserves are all tied in, and the unit goes directly to the White House. I said the White House is in on this contingency plan. It, it is, it's directly connected to the White House. Howard Hunt is connected to the White House. That unit is connected to the White House. Um, it, the contingency, the part that, that McCord worked with was in the communications in media. He had his own radio transmitter set up May the 7th, his own station in um, Washington, D.C., and he, <laughs> yes, on May the 7th, he was in his own radio frequency set up May the 7th for James McCord, and his walkie-talkies connected to the White House to hunt. I keep repeating that because on some of the shows I referred to the book, The Death of Democracy, uh, Greece and the American Conscience, and it's a story of how the CIA overthrew Greece, and the important thing was that new people in office we're in strategic positions of communications, and I hope we have time uh, to go into the men of communications that are new in the White House. I've broken down all of the men in communications that were in the White House that are ready, the same people that overthrow Greece, those that cancel the elections there, are also connected to the Watergate team. Uh, the court had his own radio frequency. He belonged on the 16th man unit. That connects directly to your White House. Howard Hunt, the man who worked with McCord for 19 of years in the CIA, Hunt was there 21 years, who had the gun, the walkie-talkies, worked on a special task force in two emergency periods. I don't know what they were. Uh, Hunt has been defined as a person who is against radicals. He resigned, he canceled the subscription to Brown University Alumni Magazine because blacks protested at a riot or a demonstration at Brown against the war in Vietnam. When Henry Kissinger spoke at graduation at Brown University, uh, Hunt came back at the students and slammed the radicals. There are no patriotic Americans. And he made a speech about the lack of patriotism in America. Um, the same patriotism that Howard Hunt wants, he's a very far right-wing Republican, is the kind that Nazi Germany called patriots. But when the war was over, we hung them in Nuremberg as war criminals. They did the worst crimes in the world. Those were the patriots. Howard Hunt is a, the White House man, is very right-wing, against radicals, against the demonstrations of the blacks. He's on record to these. And the task force, the two emergencies that he worked for, I would like to know whether they had to do with the riots following King's death or the political assassinations or the coup after Diem was overthrown. See, he was in the CIA during all of this. The overthrow of Greece, the overthrow of Diem that was planned by them, the past political assassinations and the death of King and the rioting. He is known for his special task force. Now, the man who first took credit for hiring Hunt in the White House, and later they denied it, was Charles Colson, who is the man re described in all the media as doing the dirty work for Richard Nixon. He does the dirty why the President of the United States needs dirty work, I don't know. But one example the media gave of the kind of work Colson does, and he works with Hunt, is when Senator Tidings was running for office in Maryland, Life magazine accommodated uh, Spiro Agnew and Nixon and ran smears against Tidings that he was involved in a lot of corruption in Maryland. And then when the elections were over and Tidings lost the election, uh, it turned out that he was innocent of all the charges and... Colson wrote the article behind the White House removing a man from the Senate by smearing him through Life magazine. I've mentioned that as a source of CIA writers that are used all the time to, to make or break a person. They can build them up and slam them down. 
by the directions of the White House, depending on how they want to manipulate candidates. And this is that is Charles Colson described as Nixon's dirty man. He works with Hunt. Um, now, Frank Sturgis at the White House, I mean at the Watergate Hotel, was organizing Cubans to demonstrate in Miami. He has been rounded up. You see, after he was arrested, this is the way I got my information. So after the men were arrested, a rash of articles came out in the last two weeks about the various men. One article could say Sturgis spoke to some Cubans about demonstrations in Miami. And then the article could be about 30 other things, which I broke down and cross into demonstrations, finances, and provocations, and 30 subject categories I broke down the Watergate operation into. But Frank Sturgis, in relation to the Taglin allegations, is the man who organized, was organizing Cubans for the Democratic Republican Convention. They, they say two of the men at the Watergate Hotel were Democrats, therefore it wasn't a, um, there wasn't a central plan to this thing. There were some Republicans, some Democrats. The central plan was to get the people out on the street. Bernard Barker, Frank Sturgis, and Eugenio Martinez. Three of the men arrested at the Watergate with Mr. McCord, who's going to do the security in Miami, are known hiring agents of provocateurs specifically for these elections. They were also involved with the men in the entire Bay of Pigs operation and work with the CIA all the time. I'm talking about the conventions that are coming next week. Frank Sturgis was organizing Cubans to demonstrate in Miami. Eugenio Martinez had called the University of Miami to make reservations to bring in 3,000 young Republicans. Now, the Young Americans for Freedom was completely infiltrated by right-wing Nazi uh, persons who organized in Munich, Germany, that came into Dallas, Texas at the time John Kennedy was killed and are supporting Agnew right now. So if, they, if Nixon were killed, uh, there are a lot of people that want Agnew for president like they wanted uh, Lyndon Johnson for president. And a group of violently radical right-wing Nazi hardcore extremists that think Nixon is a softy could be. I'm not saying there are. They could be those young Republicans. I would like to know the guest list of the 3,000 young Republicans that Martinez, with all of his money, has brought into Miami. Where are they going to go after they register? He is responsible for 3,000. They may be the San Diego crowd that would have done the demonstrations in San Diego, but specific reservations he is responsible for. And he has a lot of money, there's $89,000 that he's working with these men, could be his. Okay, Bernard Barker was arrested at the hotel. He was planning demonstrations for Richard Nixon. He wanted to prove of Richard Nixon's mining the harbor at High Pond and demonstrate in favor of the war. Getting people on the street to demonstrate for Nixon's war at the Democratic and Republican Convention is like the Sunday afternoon at the Roman Coliseum or as they shooting out at the Soledad prison, the original shootout where they had the blacks and whites segregated, and then opened up those cages and said, okay, boys, go out and do it, and then shot the three blacks they wanted to get all along on the spot. This is a very popular demonstration that Bernard Bark is lining up for this week down in uh, Miami. They're all out on bail, these men, too. They're not locked up for this next week. Now, Bernard Barker is another beauty. He's a Democrat in the crowd. He, when they were arrested, they found the hotel suite that McGovern's going to use. The plans for his news conferences and his hotel rooms were among the things confiscated at the Watergate Hotel. And not only that, but an architect named Bernard Glass in Miami said that seven or eight months ago, Bernard Barker had come in and wanted the floor plans. That was in our Monterey Herald here, that art, long article. But he wanted the floor plan of the National Convention and... Uh, he said he had a friend in Puerto Rico that wanted to build a convention hall. Could he have the floor plans of the Democratic National Convention? And the architect, you knew him for a long time, Bernard Gla uh, Leonard Glass, said, no, I don't have those and I can't give them out. So he said, would you get me the air conditioning system for the, for the whole convention hall in Miami, the air conditioning system? Well, you're going to blow up a lot of people. I'm not saying it was for that, but Tackler said they're going to have a lot of killing and demonstrations, and if you have the exits and the entries and the air conditioning system set up and you're planning it months in advance, you certainly have something in mind. It isn't that they just want to set an electronic device, because these are the highest skilled snoopers in the entire world. They've been in agencies, counterintelligence, and espionage, cloak and dagger work for 11 known years and more before that. So Bernard Barker wants the air conditioning plans. He's caught with McGovern's hotel room plans. 
He's planning demonstrations for the approval of Nixon's mining. Worse than that, Bernard Barker offered Leonard Glass, he said, I have contacts high up in the White House, Howard Hunt in the White House, who, if you give me the air conditioning plants, will get you architectural contracts down in Central America. We have a lot of contacts, and we'll you know, get you building buildings down in South America if you get us the air conditioning plants. That's how important the blueprints were for the Democratic Convention, and now that it's moved from Miami, the Republicans are going to share the room. Just last week, after these men were arrested, every key to the Democratic and Republican National Committee Convention halls was stolen. And the keys had to be made over because every single room and lock on a 15-key master chain was taken from a locked case from a locked hotel room of the man responsible for the hall. Now, just by coincidence, one of the men arrested at the time of the Watergate, Mr. Virgili Virgilio Gonzalez, owns a lock shop. He, he has a little, he's a locksmith down in Miami called the Stolen Lock Shop, or the, the Stolen Key Shop. You know, there's a lot of humor in this thing. Like the, the meeting of Barker from Miami, who's the funding man of the whole day of things, uh, up to Howard Hunt um, up in, in uh, Washington, the conduit of funds for the plans that they had pitched. But Barker met the man that they were supposed to call, Mr. Cody. Barker's wife had a phone number the night of June 17th in case the, the boys weren't home from their little outing and didn't call by 3 a.m. She was to call an attorney named Mr. Cody, Caddy in Washington and get some help for them. Well, Mr. Caddy met Bernard Barker, the husband of the woman who called him, just a year ago, he said, at the Army-Navy Club in Washington, D.C. Well, the Army-Navy Club, the Army-Navy game was where John Kennedy was supposed to be killed. This is one of the coincidences that occurs through this whole thing. The plans to kill uh, uh, John Kennedy were in Miami, and the Secret Service got information about it and the whole blueprint of that assassination attempt, so they airlifted him in a helicopter to the hotel when he went to Miami. That was just weeks before he was actually killed. Then the killing plan was moved to Chicago, and the Secret Service got wind of that. The killing was to be at the Army-Navy football game, which again involved the name Oswald and a high-powered gun, and they went to the house of a man involved in this plot and took the guns away. So that was called off. And three weeks later in Dallas, John Kennedy was killed. But the Army-Navy game was where he was to be killed. And, and Bernard Barker met Cody, the lawyer who's the representative of the Army-Navy club. It's just a sideline of coincidences like the locksmith with the missing, it's the missing link lock shop in, in Miami, Florida. And the week that the employee of the missing link lock shop is arrested, all the keys have to be remade down in Miami, probably at the Mystic Link Lock Shop. Now, the man who got away, uh, supposedly Angel Ferrer, um, from the Watergate Hotel, was the man who trained at Fort Jackson with the United States Army. The veterans of the Bay of Pigs in 1961 were pulled back after the war, and they weren't satisfied that their military expedition was called off or that John Kennedy didn't want this kind of invasion of Cuba. So they got their heads together and got to Fort Jackson where at least 8,000 of them formed troops called ex-combatiantes of the Bay of Pigs, the refugees from the Bay of Pigs, and they were trained with military arms and might. And Angel Ferrer had offered the Washington Committee direct action to combat the left-wing causes in Miami. The troops were offered direct action. That's the guns and bullets. So at the Watergate Hotel, you have James McCord, who is in charge of the security for the National Committee. And this is important. You see, Lewis Tack would surface in 1971, and he had a press conference in Los Angeles. And he asked the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times covered it, the San Francisco Chronicle covered it, the Washington Post. Newsweek was invited. I don't remember if they had anything time or like It was a large press conference, and he talked about Squad 19. Now... You would think that the Secret Service, in lieu of the plans to kill Richard Nixon or to take over the country in martial law, but you would think that the Secret Service, if it's there to protect a democracy where we vote for candidates and have an open government, a Congress and a cabinet and a government, would investigate the Lewis Packwood charges about Squad 19 and every allegation because they only had less than a year to do it. And if one bit of truth was in, in those allegations, 
the Secret Service would have known who they were hiring to protect the president and to avoid the provocations in Miami. No, the man who was hired by the Secret Service for the Republican Convention works with the men hiring the provocation that's going to take place that would allow the martial law to happen. So it would even allow, you know, how do we know uh, the chain of command that I've broken down, particularly through Mr. Barker and Sturgis down in Miami, links to the large operation in Texas, in California, that Lewis Tackler was talking about, which does not include Richard Nixon in their plans. And I have said on many shows that I believe Richard Nixon would be killed. The chain of command from these people links to those elements in our American system that are much farther right. I have the names of three particular men that link up to the past assassination teams and church organizations as fronts, and they connect through the two Miami organizations of Bernard Barker and uh, Frank Sturgis, who were arrested at the Watergate Hotel. Now, May, yeah. you got all the names of these men that are involved in, you know, the Bay of Pigs, uh, invasion that didn't really come off yeah. and you've got uh, the two conventions being held there in Miami not far from Cuba um, lately in the last uh, few weeks Fidel Castro has been in the Soviet Union and just within the last uh, 48 hours or so uh, the Soviet Union in a, what's a, an unusual statement for the last few years has come out demanding uh, demanding that the United States withdraw from Guantanamo base in Cuba and uh, reaffirming their support for Fidel Castro, and suddenly, uh, in, just in, within the last few days, Cuba has become a source of interest to the Soviet Union <laughs> and a, a, a headline maker. Remember last week on the show, I brought in an article about Cuba. That one article that said the State Department might send Nixon to Cuba before the elections, and I said if he needs those anti-Castro, anti-communist votes in Miami, why would they send him to Cuba? Because He's losing a hunk of the Southern votes, you know. Well, and then all this, and then I read the counter article with it that the Soviet Union said, we'll always stand by you, Castro. We're one and the same in their communists. And then the news this Friday uh, said the Soviet Union is in close combination with Cuba, the great love affair that hasn't been in the news all this time. Uh, there are reasons for this. Um, if I put my thinking cap together, I would say this that for one thing, I feel that the Soviet Union does not mind Richard Nixon either being killed or being president. They said last week he's the best candidate the Soviet Union could have because so long as he stays in power, the fascism that's in this country surfaces and it's not so subtle and people know it. If you have Hubert Humphrey or Lyndon Johnson as the president, they are controlled by the fascists, but it's a little more subtle, you see. Uh, Johnson has all those Texas cronies around him. He doesn't have the na the Nazis like Strangelove, you know, the Kissingers and the the whole German, the Kraut team up there. He he is more subtle about it. It's, it's just an old folksy gathering in the National Security Council, you know, when Johnson, their old corn cone, you know. But when you get Nixon with those hardcore Nazis and the Galen operation surfacing, working while Johnson was there, but more apparent. And everything Nixon does is more obvious and, and open in his fascist tactics. You know, um, it it helps the communist cause. We have made more people communists or communist sympathizers since Nixon's been in power four years than we ever could do. Uh, certainly, India, if it had a choice, will go all communist because they hate uh, the United States. They, we said our traveling monkeys, I call them again. You know, Reagan's doing his voyage now, and Kissinger's out there, and Rogers. Those three of them are out buttering the oil crowd, you know, Greece for Greece, and they're doing their traveling, and it's so disgusting. But uh, old Connolly's trying to talk the officials in India into being nice and sympathetic to America. And Mrs. Gandhi was very firm, I do not approve of the war in Vietnam. I don't, she isn't bowing to American dollars. She did not kiss John Connolly and say, you're the great, you know, God from America. Uh, we're turning more people into communists as long as we have this kind of administration. We help the communist cause more than any other thing we could do. And so I think that the Russians will play up their love affair with Cuba and provoke a scene for Richard Nixon, like the invasion, That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, the, I, the invasion of South Vietnam at the time of election, moving south as his forces to say, okay, Dick, what are you really going to do? Well, if you called, do you think you could call the, the Bay of Pigs invasion an attempt to appease the 
anti-Castro Cubans in the United States or to win their support? You mean the intent of going into the Bay of Pigs at Right, I'm time? wondering, you know, oh, if the same men who were involved in the Bay of Pigs are involved in the Watergate Hotel. Oh, they're incident. all involved. Uh, the motive, if, if the Watergate Hotel operation had been successful, and you have to assume that it wasn't because the men were arrested and caught in the act, uh, who lost? Well, I know who gained. Maybe the electoral system gained. Maybe we'll be able, uh, if it isn't hushed up too much, you see, it's hard. Who lost was the entire squad, 19, Richard Nixon on down, because this isn't true yet. You know, it's going to get into articles in the news media, and Richard Nixon, he lost his, the head of his committee to re-elect him. John Mitchell, Martha Mitchell said, I'm a prisoner, um, I'm a political prisoner, I've been assassinated, what country can I go to? I've seen dirty work. The whole exposure, Martha Mitchell says, I saw dirty work. Well, you know, they say uh, cabinet wives and, and congressional wives are, are tired and they don't see their husbands, they have late hours, and Martha's cracking, she wants her lover boy home. That's a bunch of bull. She doesn't want him home, she wanted him the head of the Justice Department. She was furious when he resigned in March. She didn't want him less hours because the Justice Department is more demanding. But now he, he gave up that all-important job of Attorney General of the United States to run the campaign. He's been forced to resign. He lost. Martha Mitchell is a prisoner. Um, somebody's going to lose. Either they're going to kill her. They, she's locked up now and only a doctor can visit her. That was in the paper yesterday. And um, she's, he's accompanied by a police. She's as much of a prisoner as Arthur Bremer, the alleged uh, would-be assassin of Wallace, who's been moved to a mental hospital. They either have to alter his brain or kill him or isolate him or find him not fit for trial because Richard Nixon and John Mitchell were in on that attempt at Wallace. Um, the Hoover thing isn't over yet. Patrick Gray the third isn't appointed. We don't have a head of an FBI. I think the Republicans are... Uh, uh, going to be running around a lot in the next few months, and the Watergate is going to do the thing that will point up to all of the things that they've gotten away so far. How important are these ties to uh, to Cuba? Well, or the, the is it a coincidence that, it, that just the same team was used? Uh, well, the importance of Cuba was this. When Cuba was overthrown, almost every man that was in the invasion of Bay of Pigs uh, would have worked with Castro. They supported Castro. They wanted him in. You see, Cuba was a gambling center. It was like Sicily is to the mafia. It was the headquarters of the syndicate and organized crime, which later had to shift to Las Vegas and New Orleans. It had to shift, but it was the world headquarters of the Western world, of organized crime and the syndicate. And the men who put Castro in could see that Batista was corrupt and cruel, and one of the men that was arrested at the Watergate was chief of police for uh, Batista. But, you know, uh, they were cutting off people's fingers and necks, right and left, and Batista was cruel. And this team could see that um, uh, Batista, the handwriting on the wall of Batista was going to be put out. The people couldn't stand his oppression. So they supported Castro to get into power. And when Castro got into power, he came in as a populist vote. He went to Cornell University. He's a scholarly person. He uh, was interested in reforms, land reforms, economic reforms. So the same people that belonged to the Batista establishment switched, switched their allegiance to Castro. But when Castro took power, he kicked them all out. He took the Hilton Hotel, he took the resort hotels, he turned them into hospitals and schools, and he said, just move your ass out of Havana, out of Cuba, I don't want you either. And they said, well, we helped you fight guerrilla fighting to put out Batista, and he said, I don't want you. The, the land of Cuba is for the people, for their education, their health, their welfare, and you get out. And Russia... Instead of America supplying Castro with the money to get rid of Batista, Russia came in and helped Castro make the reforms and kick the Americans out. We wanted it as another imperialist country. And so we, does that make sense? They, they, we were kicked out after we helped Castro get to power. Well, all the gambling tables were lost then. One of the men arrested at the Watergate Hotel was in charge of the gambling tables after Castro took over. And he represents the, the link to the organized crime. He was the head of the gaming table, see. But after Castro kicked them out, they came to the United States, and about 30,000 of them went to Spain, a, a people that didn't want to live under Castro. And the large group, the, you know, the elite economic class, the businessmen, the doctors, the lawyers, the people that were keeping the oppressed under their thumb and, and taking the wealth of the sugar economy and so forth, 
were kicked out of Cuba and fled, and their land was confiscated, and they moved to Miami. And the American State Department then was very anxious to recruit any refugees that were kicked out by communism as a team to reclaim that land. They said, we will help you. This is why in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the refugee, the Russian Refugee Committee, all of Lee and Marina Oswald's friends were oil people from the Soviet Union and hoped that, that by saying Oswald was a communist when he was actually an agent of Navy intelligence, that they could instigate anxieties against communism and increase this Cold War strategy. See? So we use these refugees then to bake the basis of a military team that will go back. And in exchange for their working for the FBI and CIA, we offer them a lot of money. You know, in, in exchange for creating this communist thing, they help us have an excuse to build up an army against the evil communists. Just like John Mitchell, money goes to paid provocateurs to ride on the streets, and John Mitchell asks an increase of 10 million of uniforms and mace because we have rioters. It gives them every law of surveillance and data banks and communications that they need in the Justice Department. They create the need by paying the people to make fights on the streets and break buildings and burn buildings, paid provocateurs did this at the time that Martin Luther King was killed. And then after they have the provocateurs clubbing and hitting and, and running and getting out of arrest, they're always immune from the arrest, then they create the law to take care of the next riot and you get a new tax squad. So this increases that Hitler got more power by putting down the radicals. He put the radicals on the street. He'd increase his power. Well, what I'm trying, I have to wind this up now, and uh, it's a lot of material. Uh, I'll be doing it maybe for many weeks as I refer to the political assassination of John Kennedy. John Kennedy was killed because a group of people in Washington, D.C. and New York did not want his young opinion on certain reforms or his representing a broad base of people to take hold of the economy or the youth of this nation or the voters' imagination, or the desire to end warfare state. He was killed, and uh, Lyndon Johnson took his place. The team that manipulated that kind of a murder is a complicated team. It goes from the White House, from men like Richard Nixon and Howard Hunt. In those days, it was another team. And I have all their names, like George Bundy and Lyndon Johnson, and that team on down, Ross Dow and Russ, that was the team in those days. Uh, we go down to, to the FBI. John Mitchell is the Attorney General, and uh, he still works with, with Patrick Gray. We don't even have an FBI head now. goes on down to the armies, the paid provocateurs, the, the men in Miami, real estate men, notary public, the professional level, uh, such as Sturgis and Barker, who are prominent in Miami with well-known Republicans, well-known Democrats. It crosses both lines. One's a Democrat, one's a Republican. And they associate with the street fighters, the trained people, the army troops, like from Fort Jackson, the military. That's why the president said the military troops are going in to protect, in quotes, protect the, the election conventions. How do we know they're not going to protect or provoke like they did at Kent State? Right well, on we'll that. We'll see you next week. It's going to be a bad week. But by next week, it'll be all over, right? One week of the conventions, anyway. Yeah. You've been listening to Mae Brussel, political research specialist. She'll be back next week. <laughs>